Hi, everyone, and welcome to Occupational Therapy 236, Occupational Therapy with Youth. Uh, today's lecture is on traumatic brain injury. My name is Melissa Kay, and I'm your instructor. Let's go ahead and get started. We have five objectives for today, and we have some very active roosters who are going to help. Uh, so this is a big lecture, okay? And I'm going to do my best to divide it into bite-sized chunks for you. Feel free to watch uh, one part, and then you know when you when you get your gumption up to go on to the next part. I find that it's really fascinating content, but it's also a lot of content. So just be prepared, okay? Um, the first objective is to list the common demographics associated with traumatic brain injury or TBI, which we'll be referring to. The second objective is to identify the clinical aspects and outcome predictors that are associated with TBI. Third, explain the initial general and also OT-based treatment protocols. So what do we do when we work with somebody with TBI? Then we're going to go into a couple different classification systems in some detail. The first is the Glasgow Coma Scale, or GCS, and uh, we'll talk about that. And then uh, the next one, which we'll spend an awful lot of time on, is the Rancho Los Amigos levels and also the OT interventions and protocols that are associated with each of the levels, especially those we're going to drill in, the ones that have to do with kind of the, um, the sweet spot where OT works with those with TBI. All right, so let's get started. What is a traumatic brain injury? Well, it's defined as damage to the brain tissue that's caused by an external mechanical force with resultant loss of consciousness, post-traumatic amnesia, or PTA, and skull fracture or objective neurological findings that can be attributed to the traumatic event by radiological findings, physical, or mental status examination. So that is a mouthful. My suggestion to you is that you download the PowerPoint uh, slide deck and spend some time with this, uh, with this definition. We're gonna be going over an awful lot of the parts and pieces of it, but it's important that you have a good idea of what exactly a TBI is. So first, some statistics. Uh, this prevalence is from 2014, even though the information um, from the CDC is much more current. That's the last time that they really did an in-depth uh, deep dive. So 2.87 million ER visits are due to, to traumatic brain injury each year. It's over 56,000 deaths. 70 to 90 percent are considered mild, which is a very good thing. And we think that those numbers are actually unreported because sports injuries and kids falling down and bonking their heads are often not brought into an ER or reported. So a lot of TBIs. The leading causes of traumatic brain injury are as follows. 47%, so almost half of the TBIs are due to falls. That's followed by kind of an even divide between um, being struck by or against some hard object and traffic accidents. Then um, assault accounts for a little under 10% and uh, additional 15% are either other or unknown. So falling is a huge deal. In terms of statistics by age, the highest rates of death and hospitalization are for those who are over 75 years of age. So it makes sense when we consider the link to the frequency of falls contributing to TBI. The highest rates of emergency department visits are either 75 plus or are real little guys that are zero to four. It's the leading cause of death and hospitalization um, from TBI is for ages 15 to 34 
and I didn't say that very well, a car crash is the leading cause of death and hospitalization from TBI for ages 15 to 34. So again, when you think about it and you think about the ages and stages of development, <clears throat> our teens and, uh, and young adults who have more of a sense of immortality and are in their prime physically and are used to being able to engage in, uh, you know, driving fast and, um, and potentially not being quite as cautious, um, that statistic makes some sense. Uh, TBIs are more common among men. They're more common among Native Americans and Alaskan Natives. Black and Latino patients are also uh, higher risk, as are low income and uninsured patients, and finally, rural as opposed to urban individuals. All right, so let's get into our types of brain injuries. They're basically divided into open and closed head injury. With a open or penetrating head injury, there's an injury to the brain that's caused by a foreign object that's actually entering the skull. It might include uh, being shot or being struck with a sharp object. Contrast that with a closed head injury where there is no penetration of the skull, but it's caused by movement of the brain within the skull. It can be uh, caused by a fall, a motor vehicle accident, or being struck with an object that doesn't actually um, break through the skull and the skin. It, um, uh, one thing that we sometimes hear um, it called is a coup, a contra coup injury. And what that means is that the is that the brain um, is jarred and it moves forward and it's bruised in the front and then there's an impact that sends it back. So actually the front and the back of the brain or the, you know, the sides both are injured and that can account um, and lead to quite a bit of swelling, which is very dangerous when the brain is enclosed in this, uh, in this nice container, but doesn't have a lot of extra room to move around. And that's protective, of course. We also have non-traumatic brain injury. So uh, TBI and non-traumatic brain injury. These kinds of injuries are caused by drug overdose, chronic substance abuse, carbon monoxide poisoning, environmental exposure to various toxins, and anoxia or a, um, a lack of oxygen, oxygen deprivation for a period of time. With regard to substance abuse and TBI, um, Use, usage proximal to the time of injury, in other words, in close proximity, it accounts for over 50% of the adults with TBI. A larger proportion have a prior history of ETOH, which stands for uh, the chemical abbreviation for ethyl alcohol, which is basically drinking. Finally, drug overdoses are the second most common cause of trauma. Another cause of uh, brain injury is sudden cardiac arrest. It's the third most common cause of coma after trauma and drug overdose. Um, and it's 225,000 people in the U.S. per year die before they reach the hospital. Uh, $450,000, uh, sorry, 450,000 people um, experience uh, hospitalization and 80% of survivors are comatose after resuscitation with CPR, as noted above. Predicting the outcomes for these folks is very challenging. So now let's look at the initial treatment of traumatic brain injury. This is one of two slides. So when we think about um, TBIs, we initially think about management. And the American Association of Neurological Surgeons has come up with this set of protocols. Um, we want to make sure that intracranial pressure is decreased if it has been increased. So we want to look for increased intracranial pressure. And 
that can occur, uh, of course, with a closed TBI. Um, also, we, we know that steroids are not recommended for reducing intracranial pressure, although steroids are used for a lot of other kinds of inflammation. Uh, prophylactic anticonvulsants are also not recommended for preventing late post-traumatic seizures. So there's a, a different set of protocols from our general set of protocols because the person has had a traumatic brain injury. This is slide two of two, and um, it adds some details. So there's an organized trauma care system because treatment of traumatic brain injuries and, um, and trauma in general is so specialized. Within the uh, United States, each region in the U.S. should have an organized trauma care system. The Santa Clara Medical System and Stanford are the um, trauma care systems within our area, and they care for the people with TBI. Um, hypotension or hypoxia, uh, we need to monitor and correct immediately. So hypotension meaning low blood pressure and hypoxia meaning a, a, a decrease in oxygen and oxygenation of the body. Inter, uh, increased intracranial pressure is monitored um, and uh, we look at um, these risk factors. Over age 40, a Glasgow coma scale of three to eight, and CT scan hematomas or bleeding. So we're gonna go over the um, Glasgow coma scale in a little while, but that, these are just some things to keep in mind. Um, we want to provide treatment to lower ICP if it exceeds the recommended values. Um, yeah. And, um, that is, uh, yeah, that's what I have to say about this slide. All right. So in addition to those two slides worth of protocols, we also have surgical interventions. So the removal of objects like bullets or debris from the wound, evacuation of a hematoma or a blood clot, um, removal of a tumor, if that's what the cause of the uh, brain injury was. And um, we want to be sure that the bone that is remaining is in good shape. Next, we're gonna talk about clinical aspects and predictors of outcomes. So it can be very difficult to predict uh, what's going to happen to somebody who's had a traumatic brain injury and how the recovery is going to go. So we're going to constantly be thinking about that and how, about how to best foster it, as well as looking at a variety of the things that OT um, considers when we're treating someone with a TBI. The first set of signs and symptoms are those that are immediately present. So we um, divide it into um, autonomic functions and consciousness. The autonomic functions include visual signs of trauma, um, pulse, respiratory rate, temperature, BP, and diaphoresis. So we're considering can this person return to a status quo, a baseline of functioning neurologically, right? So if you remember your autonomic nervous system information, that is about regulating um, everyday function. The other thing that we're going to be looking at is consciousness. So we look at the level of arousal, the person's cognition, are they oriented? Can they answer questions about who they are, where they are, when it is, um, things like that. And then if they have lost consciousness, how long did that last and how long might they have been in a coma? We're also concerned about motor signs and symptoms. So we're gonna be looking at reflexes and voluntary movements. And when I say um, we, I mean the whole medical team, right? So typically this very immediate stuff is gonna happen with medical personnel. And then OT will come in after that once the person is more stabilized. We also wanna look for abnormal posturing, including decorticate and decerebrate posturing. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. 
We want to uh, be looking at pupillary response. So is there a dilation and constriction of the pupils when exposed to light? And are there any abnormalities in the size or the shape of the pupil? The depth of coma and the pathological signs of coma are also important, as are ocular movements and cranial nerve function. So those of you that are now studying the cranial nerves, this is where the entire neurological cranial nerve um, assessment may be used. Of course, it's gonna be used with other conditions, but definitely with TBI. We wanna see what's up with the cranial nerves. This slide um, shows you an example of decorticate posturing and decerebrate posturing. And um, my apologies for the not totally clear pictures. It was the, it was the best I could find. So on the top half of this um, drawing, you see decorticate posturing. And this is where the upper extremity is um, in a spastic flexed position, internal rotation, and adduction. The lower extremity is actually in an extended posture with internal rotation and adduction. Um, it is an injury that um, is reflective of the cerebral hemispheres, the internal capsule, and, um, and an injury above the superior colliculus. Now contrast that with decerebrate posturing which is the upper extremity and the lower extremity are both in extension. Um, there's a deduction in internal rotation, the wrist and the fingers are flexed, and the lesion is below the superior colliculus in the brainstem region. So it's a lower, it's a lower um, injury. Um, there's a poor prognosis in clients that have damage uh, below the superior colliculus. So decorticate patients um, have um, decorticate patients have a better chance of a positive outcome than decerebrate. Once again, just to be clear. So um, there's a poorer prognosis for clients who have decerebrate posturing as opposed to decorticate. And it makes sense, right? Because the brainstem is associated with a lot of our autonomic functioning or our basic um, everyday functioning to keep us alive, to keep us regulated, et cetera. Another um, sign of TBI and, and, a, and a symptom of it is amnesia. And there's a few different kinds of amnesia that we might see. We might see retrograde amnesia, which is um, a person unable to remember events due to the neurological damage, um, but uh, they, um, it's associated with the length of amnesia for events prior to the injury. Um, and they typically, I believe, remember things prior to the injury. There's anterograde amnesia, um, and this is a person unable to consolidate information for storage and retrieval. So they have it in there somewhere, but they just can't access it. And finally, there's post-traumatic amnesia or PTA, and we're going to be talking about that more. This is following the injury. Uh, the patient is confused and seems unable to store or recall any new information. All right, so with post-traumatic amnesia, we measure the length of time after the injury when the day-to-day -day recall returns and full orientation is present. So if a person has mild um, PTA, it's less than an hour before they return to normal function. Moderate is one to 24 hours, severe up to a week, very severe up to a month, an extremely severe PTA lasts for more than four weeks. There's also a number of secondary medical issues that can accompany a TBI, right? So um, it's not directly associated with the head injury, but um, you know, if you've been in an auto accident, there's a lot of things that are going on, for example, potentially in addition to the head injury. 
Um, there's orthopedic injuries and uh, the weight bearing status of the individual could be compromised. Pulmonary status, decubitus ulcers, which are um, an ulcer that's initially of the skin and, um, and this is something that arises from not being able to move under one's own power. So laying in, um, in bed for a long period of time, and, um, it's due to prolonged pressure. So decubitus ulcers are also known as bed sores and, uh, the treatment or the, the prevention for that is to turn the patient often and to, um, monitor them closely so that they don't develop these ulcers. There's also combination injuries. For example, if a person has a TBI and they also sustained a spinal cord injury. This combo of injuries accounts for about 30 to 50% of brain injury cases. So a, a double whammy, if you will. Now let's talk about prognosis. Here are some predictors of prognosis, age, the person's lifestyle, their social support system, how much drug and alcohol use they had prior to the incident, and the length of time that they were in a coma or had post-traumatic amnesia.